Carl Friedrich Gauss was one of the most important mathematicians to exist in the 19th century. He is sometimes referred to as the greatest mathematician since antiquity, or princeps mathematicorum, which means the foremost of mathematicians. A glimpse into what he is notable for includes his contributions to the theory of magnetism, proving the fundamental theorem of algebra, deriving the function representation of the normal distribution, and being PhD advisor to Richard Dedekind and Bernard Riemann, who would themselves go on to be very influential mathematicians. Gauss was born Johann Carl Friedrich Gauss on April 30th, 1777, in the Duchy of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel, now part of Lower Saxony, Germany. His parents were poor working class citizens, and with his mother being illiterate, Gauss's date of birth was never recorded. She only knew he was born on a Wednesday, eight days before the Feast of Ascension, which occurs 39 days after Easter. Gauss derived methods to compute the date of Easter in any year, and was able to then figure out his birth date. Gauss was known to be a child prodigy. There's many variations of the story, but the way it usually goes is that when Gauss first got to elementary school in 1784, the class was asked to find the sum of the integers from 1 to 100. Soon after the question was presented, Gauss provided the solution, having recognized that 100 times 101 divided by 2 would yield the result. With the support of his elementary school teacher, Gauss went on to attend senior secondary school in 1788 where he studied language. He drew quite a bit of attention for his intellectual abilities, including from the Duke of Brunswick. The Duke provided him funding to attend university, thus allowing Gauss to attend the Collegium Carolinum from 1792 to 1795, and the University of Göttingen from 1795 to 1798. 1796 was apparently quite the year for Gauss. He advanced modular arithmetic, which greatly simplified manipulations in number theory. He was the first to prove the quadratic reciprocity law, which allows mathematicians to determine the solvability of any quadratic equation in modular arithmetic. He discovered every positive integer is representable as a sum of at most three triangular numbers. And he showed that a regular polygon can be constructed by a compass and straight edge if the number of its sides is the product of distinct Fermat primes and a power of two. Construction problems had occupied mathematicians since the ancient Greeks. So this construction discovery firmly turned Gauss towards a career in mathematics instead of studying language. In 1798, Gauss left the University of Göttingen without a degree. But he did complete his writing of a fundamental work in number theory, officially being published in 1801, titled Disquisitones Arithmeticae, or Arithmetical Investigations in English. This was a pivotal work as it consolidated number theory as a discipline and shaped the field as we know it today. After leaving the University of Göttingen, Gauss returned to Brunswick in 1799, finally receiving his degree. The Duke agreed to continue Gauss's funding, but requested that Gauss submit a doctoral dissertation to the University of Helmstedt. Gauss knew a professor there named Johann Friedrich Pfaff, which made it easier to get his dissertation through and ultimately get his PhD. The work that Gauss submitted provided the first proper proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra, formulated over the real line, as well as arguments against people's previous attempts at proving the result. Gauss actually proved the fundamental theorem of algebra four times in his lifetime. The first proof in 1799 was topological in nature and doesn't hold up to the rigor of today's standards. The second proof was published in 1816 and was influenced by the approach that was originally taken by Euler without assuming the existence of roots. This proof is both complete and correct, rigorous enough for today's standards. The third proof was published later in 1816, sharing the topological spirit of the first proof. His fourth and final proof was provided in 1849, 50 years after his first proof. The approach taken was similar to the first proof, simply extending the theorem to work for complex numbers. Things seemed to be going quite well for Gauss after returning to Brunswick. 
and he got married to Johanna Astaf on October 9th, 1805. Sadly, the Duke of Brunswick died on November 10th, 1806, about two months after Gauss and his wife had their first child, Joseph. Gauss ended up getting an offer to work as the director of the Astronomical Observatory at the University of Göttingen in 1807. It seemed this was the most appropriate move to make, especially after the Duke died. Aside from the Duke's death, more tragedy would strike Gauss upon his move to Göttingen. On April 14th, 1808, Gauss's father died. This was about a month and a half after Gauss and his wife had their second child, Wilhelmina. On October 11th, 1809, Johanna died, just two days after their four-year anniversary and a month after giving birth to their third and final child, Louis. And on March 1st, 1810, Louis died. Considering these terrible events, especially the death of Johanna, Gauss attained a depression that he'd be afflicted with for the remainder of his life. But he didn't let this affect his work, publishing his second book in 1809. This was a major two-volume work on the motion of celestial bodies, titled Theory of the Motion of the Heavenly Bodies Surrounding the Sun in Conic Sections. Volume 1 discusses differential equations, conic sections, and elliptic orbits. Volume 2 showed how to estimate and then refine the estimation of a planet's orbit. Focusing heavily on astronomy until 1817, Gauss still found time to work on other things, such as general investigations of curved surfaces, which was a rigorous treatment of series and introduced the hypergeometric function, and determination of the accuracy of observations, which was a discussion of statistical estimators. In 1818, Gauss was asked to carry out a geodesic survey of the state of Hanover to link up with the existing Danish grid. This led Gauss to become heavily focused on the study of geodesy, which is the branch of mathematics dealing with the shape and area of the Earth or large portions of it throughout the 1820s. His work on the Danish grid project led him to creating the heliotrope, which worked by reflecting the sun's rays using a design of mirrors and a small telescope. Alas, the measurements ended up missing the mark, leaving Gauss to wonder what kind of mathematician he really was. Regardless of the geodesy hiccups, Gauss still pursued mathematical physics. In 1832, Gauss began working with Wilhelm Weber on the theory of terrestrial magnetism. The work Weber and Gauss did together led to the discovery of Kirchhoff's laws, and to the building of a primitive telegraph that could send messages a distance just shy of one mile. By 1840, Gauss had written three papers on terrestrial magnetism, all of which dealt with the current theories at the time, as well as absolute measure of magnetic force and an empirical definition of terrestrial magnetism. Gauss became kind of notorious for letting mathematical results ripen. It's claimed that if he had published all of the results that he'd let ripen, mathematics could have been 50 years ahead of what it currently is. A prime example of this ripening, which Gauss never actually published work for, is non-Euclidean geometry. His wondering of the existence of non-Euclidean geometry began in the early 1800s. He primarily corresponded with Farkas Bollier on this matter, but expressed that he developed a non-Euclidean system for himself to tinker with in a letter written to Torinus in November of 1824. In 1831, Bollier's son Janos had published work on non-Euclidean geometry, but Gauss's response was essentially that he derived this years earlier, being occupied with these thoughts for 30 to 35 years. Gauss would later express something similar in a letter to Schumacher in 1846, regarding a work published by Lobachevsky in 1840. So, even though Gauss probably didn't mean it to sound the way it did, he was essentially giving off the vibe that the results weren't that impressive since he'd already discovered them years ago, but just never published them. Returning to Gauss's personal life, Gauss got married to his previous wife's best friend, Mina Valdek, on August 4th, 1810. This was about five months after the death of his son, Louis, and given how depressed Gauss was over the death of Johanna, let alone all the other events that had unfolded up to that point, it is speculated this marriage was largely for convenience, despite having a marriage with Mina for about 21 years. Gauss had three children with Mina. Eugene, born in 1811. Wilhelm, 
born in 1813, and Teresa, born in 1816. Gauss wasn't very supportive of his children pursuing mathematics, for fear they could never live up to his quality of work, and thus tarnish the Gauss name. This presumably led Eugene and Wilhelm to immigrate to the United States, Eugene immigrating to Missouri in 1832, and Wilhelm following suit in 1837. They both independently became very wealthy entrepreneurs, so this move seemed to be quite successful. In the year following Teresa's birth, Gauss's mother moved in, as she was too ill to take care of herself. Mina and her family had been trying to persuade Gauss they should move to Berlin, as Gauss got an offer from the University of Berlin to work there. Gauss wasn't too keen on the change, and with his mother moving in, this seemed to be the nail in the coffin for any ideas for moving to Berlin. Gauss's mother lived with him and his family until she died in 1839. After Mina died on September 12, 1831, and Teresa becoming the caretaker of the household, she tended to her grandmother, and then ultimately her father. As is quite clear, Gauss made incredible contributions to mathematics and mathematical physics, but he was also able to make incredible contributions to his pockets. From 1845 to about 1850, 1851, Gauss worked on updating the Widow's Fund for the University of Göttingen. The experience he gained from this led him to make investments in bonds issued by private companies, which turned out to be incredibly successful. After this series of investments, Gauss began to focus almost primarily on mathematical physics, and he went on to do this until his death on February 23, 1855, fortunate enough to pass in his sleep. Well, there you have it. A very brief history on one of the most important mathematicians, if not the most important, of the 19th century. Thanks for watching, and long live Gauss.